Thank you very much. Um, before I set out on this little jaunt, uh, everybody told me I was going to die. <laughs> I, um, I applied to Sir Ranulph Fiennes's Transglobe Expedition Trust for funding, um, and they went away to their uh, Amazon expert, and he came back saying that to walk the entire length of the Amazon River was impossible. Um, luckily, they've got this lovely tradition of supporting mad but marvellous expeditions, so they said, right, okay, this guy clearly qualifies, he's absolutely mad, and if he comes back alive, that would be marvellous, and so they chucked me some money. Um, the only people who actually said that the uh, expedition was possible and that I would succeed were my family and friends, which was really sweet. And my mum, for example, said, oh, I know, Edward, you'll, you'll definitely get to the end, which is brilliant, but she hadn't got a clue what she was talking about. Um, the plan was really, really simple. We were going to leave the Pacific coast of Peru, walk up and over the Andes mountains, find the furthest source of the Amazon River, uh, walk pretty much the whole length of Peru, through the southern tip of Colombia, and then right the way across Brazil to the mouth of the, um, of the Amazon. Logistically, that's pretty easy to do. You keep the river on the left-hand side, you keep walking downhill, and two and a half years later, you end up at the Atlantic Ocean. Um, <laughs> In my mind, I wanted it to take a year, so I divided the length of the river by 365 days and I came up with 11 miles a day. And I thought, yeah, I could walk 11 miles a day, that doesn't sound too far. But literally, with sort of machete in hand, opening a path through the jungle for about 65% of the journey, uh, we averaged four miles a day, so the expedition took 860 days to complete. Um, Luke, Luke Collier was the guy who I started this expedition with and um, him and I were based in London before I started and we had every opportunity to go to the Royal Geographical Society to get the official coordinates for the official further source of the Amazon but we didn't, we went to Wikipedia instead and, um, <laughs> and not surprisingly the coordinates were completely wrong so we were on the wrong mountain and the river that fed off it didn't even flow into the Amazon basin at all um, but we sort of used the force a little bit and eventually found this quite famous white cross um, and you can see this little trickle of water flowing down on the right hand side of the screen and we thought oh, brilliant okay so we took some photos uh, but then we found another cross an iron cross and then we found a plaque a metal plaque and then we found a fourth item a plaque as well we thought this is rubbish there can't be four official further sources of the amazon so we decided as there was glaciers above us and therefore sort of subglacial streams that we would just cover all bases summit the mountain on which the further source of the amazon springs and then there's definitely no water above us um, from this point onwards, I have to admit, quite a few things started going downhill. And then sadly, one of the first things was my relationship with Luke. Um, we'd, we were quite different characters, and, and um, I was ex-military, he was a sort of outdoor instructor, a climber and kayaker, but, but um, the relationship started to deteriorate and it became like we were trapped in a bad marriage. Literally the way Luke would uh, drink his coffee in the morning and wouldn't be able to talk to anyone else and wouldn't be able to concentrate on anything else until he drank his coffee would really piss me off. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And I know that I pissed him off a lot in return as well. Um, but to cut a long story short, after three months, Luke said, Ed, I've had enough of you, and he went home. Um, just coincidentally, at this time, the expedition did actually start getting quite a lot more serious. This is a Rondero outpost in the Red Zone. Um, the Red Zone being the drugs trafficking area of Peru. Two-thirds of the world's cocaine is grown in this area, and the headwaters of the Amazon just go straight through. Um, and so these guys, the Ronderos, they're put in place of the police force of Peru, because if the police force go in, they'll be shot by the drugs traffickers. So these guys police the area for petty crimes like theft, etc. And these were the guys who were asking permission of to come through, and increasingly they were just saying, you're absolutely crazy. You're a white man with an HD video camera on his shoulder. You're going to get yourself killed. Um, the red zone also spills into an area very, very close off um, Amerindian tribes. Um, you can see their shorts and t-shirt wearing Indians, and, and the guy on the right has got a shotgun, but, but they were 100% indigenous, and, and they've been treated pretty badly by, um, by the Peruvian government, and they were very, very suspicious of outsiders. Um, I walked with these guys, the Shaninka Indians, for about a day and a half, and I'd always try and have a, a guide walking with me, but eventually uh, nobody would walk with me. And, um, I thought, OK, well, I need to reduce the risk as much as possible. So I GPSed where I'd got to. I took a boat down river to another town and again went round asking all the adult males if they'd walk with me. And nobody would. And then this little boy came up to me, um, about that high, with a massive grin on his face and said, I'll walk with you. I was like, brilliant, OK, how old are you? And he said, 16. I went, OK, that's not perfect. Um, what's your name? Elias. So Elias and I um, set off together and bought him a pair of plimp soles and a, and a pair of shorts. And um, we looked a little bit um, suspicious together, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> but on the boat, on the, way, um, on the way back to where I GPSed off, the, off the, uh, where I'd stopped walking, I said to Elias, um, why were you living with your uncle and aunt? And he said, well, because my mum was murdered with a, a nail through the throat. And my Spanish was still quite bad at this stage, so I sort of tried to convey my condolences as best I could and said, that's horrific, when was that? 
and he said uh, on Wednesday. And uh, literally, this guy's mother had been murdered six days before I met him. And I just thought, isn't that incredible? The only person who's prepared to walk through this uh, quite dangerous area of Peru is this 16-year-old kid whose mother has just been murdered. It put my own fears in, in quite a lot of perspective. Um, Elias and I walked for about six days together through various different communities until eventually we came into one called Pamakiari, which was an Ashanaka community, uh, quite deserted. And we, we walked in, and um, the first thing was a woman who ran out screaming and threw a bucket of water all over me. And then this group of women, Ashanaka women, predominantly women, um, sort of amassed in front of me, and they were very, very angry. Uh, one of them had red plant dye on her hands, and she smeared it all over my face as a sort of insult. And it was very, I was very aware that they, they didn't want me there at all. Um, at the back of the, this group was a, a similar, well, a woman wearing similar earrings and jewellery and red face paint, and I caught her eye, and she sort of stepped forward through the crowd and held up her hand and, in a really posh English accent said, are you English? My name's Emily. And... Um, <laughs> and I was just like, thank God. Um, Emily ended up being an Italian anthropologist who had been given permission to live in this village, and she spent a year and a half gaining the trust of these people in order to go in, be allowed to go in and, and live with them and study them. And I just rocked up with my rucksack, expecting it to be all smiles, and not surprisingly, it wasn't. And because of this interaction with Emily, um, the, the, the village calmed down, but Emily was able to sort of teach me a little bit more about the background of the Ashanikas, and they've been subjected to horrendous atrocities. And um, When the Shining Path, the sort of communist guerrillas in Peru came through, whole generations of men were wiped out if they didn't join the Shining Path, and, and whole generations of women violated many times. And, and as a result, I suppose, through talking to Emily, I ended up, rather than feeling any negativity towards this like, attrition that I was coming across as I walked through, I ended up being really, really proud of these guys, because all they're doing really is defending their, their homes and their lifestyle. Um, Emily also um, introduced me. Elias had to go home. He was a little bit too young. He was joining the army. Emily introduced me to the guy on the left, who was called Cho. And Cho was a forestry worker, and he was out of work, and he said, OK, Ed, he felt sorry for me, I think. He said, uh, I'm out of work. I'll give you five days, which is how long I think it will take you to walk out of the red zone. So we started walking together. Cho is an evangelical Christian, so he started singing Christian songs in Spanish at the top of his voice, which I found really annoying, I have to admit. And, but he did have bags of confidence, and at a time when I was really, really struggling, that confidence was really necessary. And I... Um, Cho, after five days, um, Cho said to me, do you know what, I'm quite enjoying this. If you want, I'll walk with you to the next town, which he did, which was about ten days later. And then in that town, we had a little conversation, and he said, if you want, I'll walk with you all the way to the mouth of the Amazon, which he did. And uh, he literally never went home. He walked for the next two years with me. Um, he then, after the expedition, he... he um, we got him over to England. He was living with my mum over in Leicestershire uh, for about four and a half months and played rugby for my local rugby club. <laughs> and at the end of season dinner, they made him overseas player of the year, which was quite <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, um, at the beginning of 2009, um, the world was going through this horrible economic uh, downturn and all the banks were going to the war. I mean, it's still pretty much the same now, isn't it? But, but um, I just thought, what a lucky position I am. I'm in the middle of the Amazon. Nothing can really touch me. And... Um, and then I got an email from our main sponsor. We had an internet satellite link saying, really sorry, Ed, but we completely ran out of money. We can't continue to fund your trip. Um, so we thought, OK, we can't let something as daft as money get in the way of this trip. And, and actually, walking by the river was costing us quite a lot of money. So we just decided to head straight into the trees where there'd be less money spent on accommodation, on food, and hiring guides. And we just went, we took, a, took two apex points of a meander of a massive meander in the Amazon River, which was 350 kilometres apart, and just headed on a straight line straight through the forest. And, um, and it was all well and good, but because we were going away from the river, all of the dangers were exacerbated. So, you know, we were away from our evacuation route, we were away from people, so we really knew. We did a risk assessment of it, and it came out as unacceptable, and then we sort of grinned at each other and went, OK, um, not much we can do about that, really. So we just set out, and, and a lot of things happened on that journey. It ended up being the most amazing part of the of the trip because we were having to just rely on our, on our wits. All of the kit was breaking at this stage. Um, the most important bit of kit that broke was uh, the GPS. And I'd, I'd always been sort of quite proud of the fact that I knew that I could survive without a GPS and we'd got a map and compass. But um, Brazilians have got amazing 1 to 100 uh, topographical maps of their whole country. Um, but they're military maps and they wouldn't give them to me. So um, I was having to navigate off a one to four million map of the top half of South America, which <laughs> one millimetre is four kilometres on the ground, and we're moving that about a day, so moving a millimetre. So taking bearings with a map and compass was a bit comical, to say the least. Um, as I said, we had this uh, internet satellite link, and, uh, and I'd created this sort of 
it's very small online following, um, but all literally we had to do was point this thing up through a, a, a hole in the jungle canopy caused by a fallen tree, and we had the fastest uh, internet in the whole of the Amazon, literally. I was tweeting every day, uploading videos, and blogs. I knew Michael Jackson was dead within two minutes of it being announced on the internet, and bizarrely, my sister emailed me to ask me if I was okay, because I used to be a, a big Michael Jackson fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I was fine. Um, and um, the, we used this thing, I just thought, right, We've run out of money. This is a bit irresponsible. Now our insurance has lapsed. Um, all the kits breaking, including sort of all the emergency kit as well. So I put out this plea online and put a PayPal link on the website and just asked people to, don to donate to the trip. And um, the response was utterly humbling, I have to admit. Um, we had kids in South Africa donating their pocket money. We had kids in England doing teddy tombolas, where they all took their teddies into school, bought each other's teddies off them, went home with each other's teddies, and then gave me all the money, which I felt a little bit guilty about, I have to admit. Um, but it was, it was phenomenal. In the last year of the expedition, £43,000 came in from various sources in order to keep the whole thing afloat, which was, which was pretty humbling, I have to say. It's an obvious thing, isn't it, walking through a forest like this, that if you let it get to you, that it's going to be so much harder. And yet it is so difficult at times, keeping your sense of humour, because... Because deep down you don't find it very funny. It's not very funny. Um, I, I have to say I didn't find it very funny. Um, this photo has taken about two years into the expedition, so I've only got about four months left to go. And um, I, suppose, I suppose by this stage I, I knew I was going to get to the end. Um, and I don't know whether it's that I let my guard drop, but you'd think that the the most hard things about walking the Amazon would be venomous snakes or, or anacondas or jaguars or electric eels or something, or even the indigenous tribes. But I have to admit, by this stage, the far, far hardest thing was, um, was just keeping it together mentally. I was really, really struggling. And the, the tiniest of things would go wrong. Um, Cho would be two minutes late packing up his, his uh, hammock into his rucksack and he'd delay us by two minutes. Bearing in mind we've got four months left of walking and I would get furious and I'd stay in this furious mood all day and, I, and it was horrible for Cho and it wasn't particularly pleasant for me either and I just thought, this is, this is ridiculous. Everyone's always told me that you know, it's not going to be the physical part that's going to be the hardest, it's going to be the mental part, the top two inches and yet that's the one thing that I'd done no training for whatsoever. And so I decided to get the, um, the satellite phone out and I, I, I rang a um, neuro-linguistic programming expert, a sort of NLP guru, just to get a bit of advice really as to how to get out of this sort of mental trap of negativity. And um, he was brilliant. I just had three half an hour conversations with him and he, he just said, it's not surprising that you're struggling slightly. You've, you've been a sort of out of Western society and the people that you know and love and can communicate well with for so long. Um, and we were, we were all meant to interact like that. And so, he just gave me a few things to get, give me perspective again, and um, little tricks, basically, mind tricks. And one of the things he got me to do was to envisage someone in my life next to me who was really, really inspirational. And so um, when I could feel myself going into one of these almost childish moods, I would imagine uh, my first sergeant major in the military, who was a guy called Mark Hale. And, um, and Mark was a massive chap, he was a rugby player, he was a Christian, and he was um, doing an MSc in psychology, so not a sort of typical squatty, really inspirational guy, loads of charisma, and uh, whenever I could feel myself going into one of these negative uh, periods, I would imagine Mark just standing there, looking at me with a slightly bemused grin on his face, saying, Sir, what on earth are you doing? And, and I, of course, I would never have acted like that had Mark been around or had anyone been around. And it was just little things like that enabled me to laugh at myself and stop being so... Um, focused on the end to the detriment of my actual mind state. And as a result, the last um, few months of the expedition were quite a lot more positive um, as a result. That story is made a little bit more pertinent by the fact that um, I, I'd never checked the internet for, for the website for news because I didn't have enough bandwidth and I didn't have enough back, battery power. But this one day I just decided to uh, throw, throw caution to the wind and I went on the BBC website and the first, the first headline that comes up saying soldier dies in an explosion in Afghanistan and it was Mark and he, and he left behind his wife um, Brenda and his two teenage daughters. And it was without doubt the, the saddest day of the expedition for me and I just thought wow, isn't it, isn't it incredible that that, um, you know, the, the guy that I've chosen in order to continue to inspire me to do the expedition is, is, is now gone. And I sat down there for a while and I thought, well, crikey, well, that's actually, uh, in a way, I felt this bond, the fact that I'd sort of brought him up before, just before he'd died. And I ended up thinking, right, I'm deliberately going to continue using Mark to continue to inspire me for the rest of the journey, which I did. And, um, and obviously, <coughs> 
uh, well, I gave this talk before quite recently, and um, and Mark's daughter came in just before um, just before I was about to give the the talk actually, and I had this slide up, and I thought that's that's horrendous. You know, I, I can't take it out. I've got to talk about this. But luckily, she came up to me afterwards and gave me a big hug and said it was nice that she had mentioned her dad. It gets happier, I promise. Right. <laughs> the, um, the end of the expedition, you can't avoid it. It would be lovely to spill out of the Amazon, straight from the Amazon into the Atlantic Ocean. But there's this horrible road network. And uh, we were late to arrive on this road network. And we'd got our plane tickets booked for a certain date. And we'd also got uh, some media crews agreed to... Um, to be on the beach at the end of the expedition. And so we had about a week of these ridiculously long days of caning it down this, this road in the blistering sun and getting about an hour, hour and a half sleep each night. And after about a week of this, it was 20 hours or so before, the end of, before we were due to be at the beach and we were meant to be there in the morning. And, um, and um, I just said to Cho as we were walking down the street, I'm, I'm so exhausted, I'm just absolutely, I just need to have a rest. And Cho, in a sort of typically South American way, says, uh, don't be so gay. And um, I said, Cho, I'm really, I'm not being gay. Um, um, anyway, I collapsed at the side of the road, came up with this sort of, um, uh, almost like a nettle sting rash all over my body and was itching like mad. Eventually passed out in the road and then... Um, when I came around, Cho and I decided, right, we need to have two hours in forced sleep. And then we had about 17 hours left to do this 85 kilometres to the beach. So we walked all the way through the afternoon, the evening, the night. And then as the sun came up in the morning, um, it was uh, incredible. These media crews descended on us and, and, and Cho and I just started floating down the road, really. It was, in, it was incredible, um, sort of on a high of adrenaline, really. And then uh, we, could, we could smell the salt in the air. You know when you're by the seaside and you can smell the fact that you're near the sea. And then we could hear the sounds of the waves crashing. And then uh, we rounded this corner and we could just see the Atlantic Ocean stretched out in front of us. And Joe and I just instinctively grinned at each other and shrugged off our rucksacks and started legging it down the beach into the Atlantic Ocean. And also, instinctively, but I'm not sure why, we started holding hands as we... Uh, <laughs> as we ran into the ocean, I just thought, it's typical, isn't it? The one day in the world that the world's media is looking at you and you're <laughs> holding hands, skipping into the ocean. Um, the last thing I want to say is you can see the look on uh, Cho's face. He, he'd never seen the sea before at this point. He came from a landlocked part of Peru. And um, he deserves a massive amount of credit because he always knew that he'd never be able to say that he walked the length of the Amazon because he joined in month five. But he did it for completely selfless reasons and, and he's an amazing man. And, uh, and I owe very much of this expedition to him. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers.